Hi everyone, my name is Orly Alter and I will be talking about the discovery of genome scale predictors of survival and response to treatment with multi-tensor decompositions. Here are my disclosures and here is my contact information. Feel free to contact me with any questions. We're all familiar with omic data as a result of the Human Genome Project and working in the research lab. Omic data are now making their way into the cancer clinic. And the question remains, as it was, I guess, 20 years ago, what to do with the data? Coming from physics, we pioneered the use of the singular validity composition in modeling these data. The singular validity composition underlies the theoretical description of the physical world. For example, the physical activity of this prism that takes white light and separates it into its color components is mathematically described by the SVD. In using the SVD on large scale molecular biological data, we showed that it is able to find patterns in the data that are interpretable in terms of the known biology and the batch effects that underlie the data. So for example, here is one matrix, a two-dimensional data set with an x-axis and a y-axis. And um, the y-axis is genes, the x-axis are samples. The SVD finds for us patterns that look like genes which is um, the eigengene concept which we invented, and uh, patterns that look like sample. There is one-to-one -one correspondence between the gene patterns and the sample patterns, and these patterns are interpretable. We also showed that the generalization of the SVD are able to take, uh, to integrate different types of data together and find patterns that then can suggest previously unknown um, processes underlying the data. Um, we predicted a mechanism computationally in that way, and then we tested it experimentally, um, verifying it, and essentially demonstrating that the SVD and its generalizations can correctly predict previously unknown and experimentally verifiable mechanisms on the global scale, meaning the whole genome or the whole transcriptome or the interaction of the whole proteome with the genome and the trans transcriptome, et cetera, et cetera. For um, personalized medicine and personalized cancer medicine, we then invented the comparative spectral decompositions. These are generalizations of the SVD, which look at more than a single, single two-dimensional data set, more than just one two-dimensional data set. And for example, two two-dimensional data sets for the GSVD or generalized SVD, more than two two-dimensional, any number of two-dimensional data sets, higher order data sets or tensors, data where we have more than X and Y axis, also a Z axis here, for example. This is a cuboid and we can have higher order cuboids of data like that, tensors, but multiple tensors. So these are the multi-tensor decompositions in my title, and they uh, simultaneously separate the similar from the dissimilar among those multiple data sets and ultimately create a coherent model from the data by finding all these different patterns, separating the data into wavelengths in a comparative way. And to test this, we essentially looked at one of the patterns that we discovered in the data that was previously a known predictor of glioblastoma survival. And we tested it in a retrospective clinical trial experimentally and validated it. Um, so I would like to tell you about this validation of a genome-wide pattern of DNA copy number alteration that predicts survival. Just to put this in context, uh, for 70 years, the best indicator of GBM survival has been age of diagnosis. Copy number alterations have been observed in GBM tumors again and again. However, repeated attempts to associate them with a patient outcome, such as survival or response to treatment, failed. In our analysis, we looked um, several times at different data sets from the Cancer Genome Atlas, 
from the same sets of patients, that's our x-axis, we looked at normal genomes, here we have them on the left, and two more genomes, here we have them on the right. And um, in this particular case, the patients are um, um, GBM, glioblastoma, or grade four astrocytoma patients, as well as lower grade astrocytoma patients, grades uh, two and three astrocytoma. And the genomes were measured with whole genome sequencing. And we can see that the tumor genomes show great variability relative to steady state. We have amplification of chromosome seven, deletion of 10, deletion of the short arm of nine. But we can also see very clearly in the X chromosome, for example, that there are normal variations between the normal um, genomes of these patients. Those normal variations are what makes our world interesting. Um, right, because we're different, we don't have the same genomes. But when we're trying to find out what is relevant to astrocytoma, we may want to separate what is normal from what is tumor, and we may want to separate it without assuming that we know everything that is normal. Well, because we don't. And the GSVD here is the perfect tool for that, <laughs> because as you can see, so the, the GSVD takes these two data sets. And like the SVD, it separates each one of them into three matrices. Again, we have patterns that look like genomes, normal, normal patterns for the normal data set, uh, tumor patterns for the tumor data set. Again, we have cores that are non-negative diagonal matrices but with different um, numbers sitting in those diagonals for the normal data set and for the tumor data set. And we have just one set of patterns of variation across the patients that is shared in both the factorization of the normal and the tumor genomes. So what the mathematics essentially tells us is that there are patterns of variation across the patients some of them with very high weights in the tumor genomes and very low weights in the normal genomes. If we look at the ratio here and we formulate an angular distance to turn this into, um, I guess, a data science tool. If we look at, at that um, uh, assessment of the, of the ratio here of the weights, we can see what is tumor exclusive mathematically. We can also figure out what is common between the tumor and the normal data sets if they have a similar ratio here between the, what the generalized singular values in the diagonals of these matrices. And we can also find what is mathematically normal, exclu um, exclusive to the normal data. So those are the mathematical, this is the mathematical assessment or the mathematical modeling of those patterns. And it turns out that just like in the case of the SVD, um, those patterns have biological meaning. So looking at three different cases from TCGA, again and again, we found the same tumor exclusive pattern in the data. First, we looked at glioblastoma patients and their genomes were measured by Agilent microarrays. Then we looked at lower grade astrocytoma patients, their genomes were measured by Affymetrix microarrays. And then we looked at the whole genome sequencing data that I just showed you, and those genomes were measured by whole genome sequencing. And not only again, again, we found to zeroth order the same genomic pattern of variation across the whole genome in terms of DNA copy numbers, but this pattern again, again, correlated with a shorter, roughly one year median survival time for the patients. And these, the, obviously the um, GBM and the um, lower grade astrocytoma patients are completely um, mutually exclusive. We also had validation sets that are completely mutually exclusive. Um, those pat the pattern is not only uh, consistent in the sense that it comes up again, again, again in the GSVD of these data sets, or it's not just that the GSVD is mathematically universal in terms of that it finds the same pattern as tumor exclusive again, again, again in data that are different and have 
other patterns superimposed on top of it, as we will see soon, but also these maps to uh, biological pathways that make sense. Some of them were previously known, some of them were previously unrecognized in GBM, but make sense. Um, and uh, some of them are actually analogous to artificial elements that were shown to transform normal cells into tumor cells. What are the patterns that we separate from the data? You remember we have some patterns going into different wavelengths. Well, for example, we have batch effects. Batch effects that are due to GC content in the whole genome sequencing data and are exclusive to the tumor or the normal data set. We have batch effects in the Affymetrix microarray data. We have batch effects in the Agilent microarray data. Each time the batch effects are completely different and each time they are superimposed on those data sets of uh, mutually exclusive um, patients. And each time we get the same genomic pattern tumor exclusive and predicting um, the survival of the patients. We also separate the nor normal variations without knowing them in advance. And specifically here, we can see we're separating the, um, X, chrom the uh, X chromosome deletion relative to the autosome in the male patients. So this um, normal genotype-phenotype relationship is uncovered by the GSVD as common to the tumor and normal data set, separated into its own wavelengths. And we don't have to worry about removing, say, the X chromosome from the data before the analysis or any other part of the genome, which truly really analyze the whole genome. That enabled us to correct some gender labels in TCGA. And it's always good when you can correct the database. So databases, that's the way they are. Uh, TCGA obviously still our awesome data. So in our um, uh, retrospective clinical trial, we ended up with a set of 79 patients, and we were happy to be able to show and see that those patients represent the U.S. adult GBM population in terms of phenotypes of survival, uh, normal phenotypes uh, as sex, race, and ethnicity, and disease phenotypes such as age, um, which, as we said, is uh, the best um, indicator um, in clinical use uh, still today, and it has been for 70 years. Uh, we did this by comparing um, our set of patients to patients in the SEER database. We're also able to show that the classifications based upon our pattern of the genomes in our study and the TCGA genomes, um, the classifications are less, less than 1% of them are affected by the profiling technology. And we looked at all the uh, major profiling technology, right? Whole genome sequencing. We have here whole genome sequencing um, done on, on Illumina machines and uh, mapped to HG38, the Human Genome Reference 38. We have here um, sequencing done by BGI at Shenzhen on the BGI machines and uh, mapped to Human Genome Reference um, 19. So these are very different. Um, we had Agilent and Affymetrics, and Agilent was on human genome reference 18, actually. So normally, experimental batch effects reduce the precision or the reproducibility of classifications by 30%. So you would expect less than 70% um, reproducibility. Here we see that we have more than 99% reproducibility in the classification. Obviously, still intratumor heterogeneity affects um, cl the classification, um, and we see the effect being limited to about 11%. Um, what we saw in the trial, which we saw in the TCGA data, is that the predictor is statistically better than and independent of the best other indicator of GBM, which is age diagnosis. Um, 
And with a concordance index of 78%, uh, it has a very nice accuracy as well. This is in general, as well as in patients who receive treatment, the standard um, of care of chemotherapy, um, mostly temozolomide and radiation after resection, and um, which suggests that this predictor can also be used to assess the benefit of the treatment to the patient. Um, it is also independent of chemotherapy and radiation and post-surgical metrics such as the Karnofsky score and the per percent resection. Uh, here is the table with all of the statistics. You can see it in our paper. <laughs> um, we looked at the TCGA data again in order to um, evaluate the, the, and to show that the predictor is better than and independent of the existing pathology laboratory tests for MGMT, IDH1, and TART. We needed to look at TCGA because there the patients were assessed in a consistent uh, manner. Uh, for our data set, we didn't really have this information very consistently and for extremely a small number out of the 79 patients. Um, and I want to note that uh, all these predictors, not only they're single gene predictors, whereas we look at the whole genome, right? But also they um, have been predictors in other tumors before they progressed to standard of care in glioblastoma. So we hope to be able to improve the, the plans to improve the prognostic, diagnostics, and therapeutics with this genome-wide predictor of survival. And this is the first predictor, I want to say, that encompasses the whole tumor genome. The prognostic classification can, can help in managing particular situations when um, the doctors need to decide about um, intervention or waiting a little bit before intervention. The diagnostic classification can help drugs process to regulatory approval. Um, obviously, it's the whole genome and just, not just the targeted drug that um, could suggest the response of a patient to a drug, even if the drug targets just one gene. For example, even in mice, it's already been known uh, for a while that the effect of EGFR deficiency depends upon the background. Possibly, it's not surprising then that when you're looking at um, EGFR inhibitor in clinical trial, the effect of the inhibitor um, is such that maybe it helps some of the patients, but it is impossible to figure out who are these patients based upon in advance based upon the tumor's EGFR amplification alone. And um, we even have therapeutic predictions, not just of targets that sit very nicely in the pathway diagram that comes with the genome-wide pattern, but also um, specifically draggable targets that uh, we can tell are on their own correlated with survival. So both those um, aspects make them possibly more promising targets. I want to emphasize that the patient survival is the outcome of their tumor's whole genome, not just parts of the genome. Take, say, chromosome 10 deletion. We see it in the tumor profile that's most correlated with the pattern, but we also see it with the tumor profile that's among the least correlated with the, pro with the pattern and um, is actually classified to the low correlation group that has um, longer median survival. And this is a proof of principle that those comparative spectral decompositions that we developed are suitable for um, discovering clinically actionable, accurate, and precise genotype-phenotype relationships. To do that, they overcame um, several, um, three challenges, finding patterns across whole genomes of three billion nucleotides, finding patterns simultaneously across tumor and normal genomes without simplifying the complex structure of the data, and doing that in small cohorts of patients, which are typical in clinical trials. And I want to mention 
that there are so very few copy number variation associations with disease relative to SNP association with disease, even though copy number variations are much more prevalent in our genome and are implicated in both normal and tumor development. So these, these comparative spectral decompositions definitely solve a, an existing problem. Uh, this, this is just to impress upon you that yes, we need to formulate um, theorems and prove the theorems, for example, an eigenvalue inequality on the way to developing these um, comparative spectral decompositions. And here to impress upon you that we have results for more than glioblastoma. We have results for adenocarcinomas, specifically the benefit of platinum. Um, in terms of overall, overall survival past the primary treatment. We hope that this will lead to a theory, but either way, you gotta agree that we, these uh, comparative spectral decompositions find in the data um, things that other methods don't. And I wanna thank my collaborators and the support of the NCI's Physical Sciences in Oncology Network, and thank you.